Oh, we already have comments. All right, so it's noon. I want to go ahead and get started. First of all, I want to say thank you so much for joining us today. Again, this is the second segment of Postcards from Durham by street historian um, John Shelp. So, um, of course, we, as we mentioned last week, um, my name is April Johnson. I am the Executive Director of Preservation Durham, and I am here with Patrick Mucklow. He is with the Museum of Durham History. He will introduce himself. Um, but we both had spring events um, with street historian John Shelp, and of course they were canceled due to um, the coronavirus and our desire to be sure that our community stays safe and that we maintain distance um, in order for us to get through this. So we just hope that you all are getting through, you're staying safe, you're staying home. Um, we're praying for everyone. Um, do everything you can to stay happy and healthy. Um, and this is our gift to you all um, to continue the things that we do, um, to share about cultural heritage here in Durham, stories, his history, promote, the, um, the history of our community and, um, um, and do it virtually. So um, technology is a great thing and we want to continue the things that we already do in person, but we, can, we know that we now can continue those things virtually. Um, but I will let Patrick introduce himself. Thanks, April. Um, yeah, as April said, we are uh, being really mindful of the community and we want to make sure everyone is um, happy and healthy and uh, still learning. And so that's what we're here for. And we uh, appreciate everyone joining us. We had a great turnout last week, which we were really grateful for. And so we want to keep it going and we want to grow this crowd in, uh, in these weekly chats. And uh, we want to make sure that we're here on the other side of this pandemic to be able to continue to serve the public. So um, if you uh, are really happy with what you're seeing here and uh, you really enjoy uh, John's chat, um, please go to the museum's website, go to Preservation Durham's website and click the Give Now button. We'd be very grateful for uh, your support. So, uh, and I, on that note, I'll turn it over to you, John. Thanks guys. Hey everybody, thank you for joining us again this week. We're gonna continue our journey. Um, we're gonna head uh, farther east. Um, and our first postcard is gonna be uh, this clubhouse. Um, and I'm gonna talk about trolleys. I promised last week I was gonna talk about trolleys. And so, um, Durham had four trolleys, one that went uh, to the east, to the baseball field. April, is the trolley coming up? Yes. There we go. Okay, so this, each trolley had a destination. So you had one trolley going east to the baseball field on Driver Street, where the Durham Tobaccoists played their first games in 1902. You had a trolley going south to Lakewood Amusement Park. And then you had a trolley going up north towards Duke Park and then a trolley going west to the golf course. And this is the clubhouse for the golf course on Hillendale Road. Um, it's no longer there, uh, but it's right across the street from the reservoir. So it's right near the corner of Club and, uh, and Hillendale. Um, and, and the reservoir is, is the Williams uh, treatment plant and Mr. Williams, who was head of uh, waterworks for Durham, he built his house on the highest point of land in Durham, which is just a few blocks from this clubhouse. So he he built his house over there on Alabama Avenue, and there was no house in Durham higher than that. He was in charge of the waterworks, um, which gets to a point about Durham neighborhoods and how they're developed. And we'll take the street near near Mr. Williams's house. Englewood. Englewood Avenue goes from west to east, all the way across Durham. Starts in the hilltops, goes down to the creek. Goes up to the hilltops, down to the creek, up, down. You have big houses with fresh air on the hilltops, and you go down into the creek, and you have mosquitoes and smoke from all the factories in town, and flooding. You go back up to the hilltops, big houses, small houses, big houses, small houses. And that's how Durham neighborhoods change so fast. And what are we talking about, historically speaking? White neighborhoods at the hilltops, black neighborhoods down in the creek bottoms. White, black, white, black. Historically, Watts Hillendale, down into Walltown, up to Trinity Park, down into uh, what people used to call no man's land in the ditch, and up to Duke Park, and then down over towards Avondale. Also um, of note, near the clubhouse was the West Durham Airport. And this is information from B.B. Olive, an attorney in town, who as a kid would uh, round up customers for the, the pilots to fly around Durham. 
And back in the early days of airports, there was a slight decline. And so that was over near Albany and the golf course. And uh, it was the West Durham Airport. You can, you can hear more about what B.B. Olive said about that um, on the old West Durham website. And number three, and everyone knows this, who's lived here for a while, out there in the middle of a reservoir is this historic little house with a green roof, a green tile roof. And that, as every kid in the neighborhoods know, knows is uh, Santa's summer house. So whenever Santa needs to go and relax over the summer, that's his house out there in the middle of Hillendale Reservoir. Um, and I do want to point out, uh, I was walking around the golf course the other day and they were practicing good physical distancing because there was a foursome out there playing golf and they had four golf carts lined up eight, 10 feet apart. So it was kind of cute. All right, April, let's uh, move on to the next slide. This is um, moving on towards Watts Hospital. Uh, built uh, 1908 to 1913. This was the White Hospital in town uh, up on Club Boulevard as we head towards Josh? downtown. Josh? A couple stories. Yes. I'm so sorry. I was trying to get you before. Um, I, I, we, have, we already have a question. Do you want to wait to after this slide or? Go ahead. Okay. Kathy Abernathy uh, asked, um, she says she knows, she knows that there are other collections of postcards about Durham. Can you remind us where some can be visited? Some are public and some are still being assembled by other collectors. This, uh, the North Carolina collection, the Durham County Library has collect, has about half my postcards so far. There's gonna be about 500 altogether. So that's all gonna be free and online. Um, others collect postcards like Jim Wise and, and Steve Massengill. Um, and they've done books on Acadia Publishing. So you can get them on books, you can get them at the North Carolina collection, the Durham County Library, and eventually, Uh, story from Joe Lyles, an art teacher there, about uh, the hospital telling the, the custodian to all day Saturday, all day Sunday taking those pipes back to his home in his truck and called the hospital uh, Monday morning and said, uh, you know, I loved working here for all these many years, but I'm gonna retire. And the, the hospital guy said, why? And he said, because all those pipes were filled with silver, silver from the x-ray machines that were dumped into the sinks. And so he went home with many, many, many piles of silver. Um, uh, there was a bond in the 1970s to uh, fix up the, the White Hospital in town and Lincoln Hospital. Uh, and uh, it was opposed by an, an unusual partnership, and an, I wouldn't call it a partnership, but an unusual opposition. And that is the conservative white uh, organizations in town opposed the bond because they didn't want the maternity ward to be desegregated. And the Durham Committee, on the affairs of black people opposed the bond because there wasn't enough money from Lincoln Hospital. And so in the end, the bond failed uh, and Watts Hospital was never um, renovated to bring it to modern standards. And eventually you, you, you move towards the county hospital out on Roxborough Road, which is, which is now called Duke Regional. Um, and finally, uh, 1918, Spanish flu, uh, the uh, flu victims were not uh, placed here in Watts Hospital. They were talking to an old uh, mill worker in West Durham and the, the flu vic victims were um, placed in, in the basement of E.K. Poe. Uh, well, I, back then it was West Durham High School. So it was, it was uh, that was the flu ward. And um, the other patients went to regular Watts Hospital. And if today, if you go to Maplewood Cemetery behind Polly Murray's house, a little bit to the right, there's the Spanish influenza section of the cemetery. And right in the middle of the section, is a headstone for a nurse, uh, Le Leela Thompson, with a Watts Hillendale emblem on her headstone, a very poignant uh, space in the Maplewood Cemetery of Spanish flu victims and a nurse who died young. All right, so we'll move on to uh, Eno River. This is Christian's Mill. This is Christian's Mill. And I, and this is, you know, 
something to bring to your cocktail parties. The early roads of Durham did not go from town to town or from bridge to bridge. The early roads in Durham went from Ford to Ford, all across the North Carolina, not just Durham. The roads went from Ford to Ford. A Ford is where you cross the river at a shallow spot and you can get your wagon and your, and your people and your produce across the river. So um, many of your grist mills were built near not bridges, but Fords. So this was, uh, is today West Point on the, you know, it was called Christian's Mill. Christian went on to become mayor of, uh, of Durham and he's buried at Maplewood, by the way. But uh, 300 families lived out here by this grist mill and that is now a familiar scene today where uh, kids play during the Eno River Festival, right there in that very same spot. All right, so we can move on to the next. And this is uh, Camp Butner. Um, it was called the Khaki Invasion. Thousands and thousands of, of troops training for World War II would come in from, uh, from out past Falls Lake and come in into town on R&R. &R. Uh, my best friend in, uh, in, in uh, middle school, uh, his grandfather was uh, General Edwin Parker, who was the commanding general of Camp Butner. And uh, every day, every morning, Camp Butner sent a Jeep into town with the MPs to go pick up the soldiers who had misbehaved in Durham the night before to bring them back from the jail to the camp. Um, and every morning, my friend's father was in that Jeep, a young student going to um, Calvert Method School. Calvert Method School, which was the clubhouse of Forest Hills. Uh, the clubhouse of Forest Hills, which is now a park. Um, and that Calvert Method, by the way, became eventually Durham Academy. And uh, Duke offered General Parker, Camp Butner, the president's house at Duke because uh, it was vacant at the time. And General Parker declined saying he would rather stay at Camp Butner with his troops. And you can still see buildings from Camp Butner around the area, including, um, including uh, Books Do Furnish a Room uh, near 9th Street and Buffalo Chicken Wings. That was a building from, from Camp Butner. And there's a nice little museum out there. A friend of mine, Mike, runs it, and he gave me this. this the, the grounds out there are still covered with ordnance from training out at Camp Butner. And if you go out there and go to the uh, gymnasium, there's a nice little museum in there that has a lot of history of Camp Butner and the, and, um, the impact it had. General Parker, by the way, was the first uh, American commander to bring his troops across the Rhine in World War II. All right, April, go on to the slide of Tobacco Land. I have a question. Yeah. There's um, um, Niels Scudra. Uh, Niels, I'm so sorry if I'm not saying your name right. I'm sorry. But... Um, her question is, thank you for asking, her question is, um, are there any postcards that depict Maplewood's Hebrew Cemetery or the residences of prominent Jewish citizens of Durham? I'm going to talk about uh, the Hebrew Cemetery in Maplewood um, at the end of this talk. Uh, so there are no postcards of the Hebrew Cemetery, and there's one postcard that I've seen so far of Maplewood from the front. It's not really a close-up of any of the headstones there, but there is going to be more about the Maple, uh, the Hebrew Cemetery, which is not, you know, which is which was uh, uh, separate at the time uh, from Maplewood, which is right attached to it. But there's, it's a very uh, cool cemetery to walk through and learn about traditions. For instance, stones were used instead of flowers because uh, of the arid uh, areas where people came from uh, to visit their loved ones. All right, so tobacco land. Um, this is not going to be a Chamber of Commerce history uh, on these talks. Uh, speaking of Camp Butner, you had in included uh, African American soldiers who were training to protect our country uh, in World War II. And uh, one was Private Booker T. Spicely. Booker T. Spicely was, uh, was in town relaxing. He was on a bus going down Club Boulevard. And um, the bus driver told him to go to the back of the bus and Booker T. Spicely said uh, he was he, he was he was apparently too slow to do it for the bus driver and um, and they got into a into a into a yelling you know they started yelling at each other and uh, the bus driver stopped his bus right across from the hospital right across from Watts Hospital about a block away 
and they got out onto the sidewalk. It's just, it's on the ed- this is on the edge of Walltown. And the bus driver uh, pulled out his gun and shot and killed Booker T. Spicely, 1943. Um, driver got back on his bus, finished his route. Um, uh, he was brought to trial, but was uh, acquitted in, in a very short time by an all-white jury of uh, murder. And um, this led to a lot of disturbances in different areas of Durham. And a good book by Marshall Tom- Thompson about Haytai Fire and Haytai Police um, describes how the Durham Police Department realized they couldn't manage what was going on at the time. And so they, for the first time, decided to hire African-American uh, police officers uh, to, to join the force. But it wasn't desegregation because the, the, the black police officers worked in Haytai and the, and the other African-American neighborhoods and the white officers worked in white neighborhoods. But Durham was the first major city to hire African-American police officers, uh, but not necessarily for altruistic reasons. They couldn't control what was going on at the time. All right. So our next slide is of uh, Duke and Sons Tobacco Factory. Hey, John. Yeah. Could we stop for just a moment? For some reason, it looks like it's only streaming on um, Preservation Durham. And we want to be sure it's well, streaming on both. Can I keep talking while you, while you fix that so we don't make the other people wait? Um, well, I have to un- undo the live and then start over, start the live over. I don't know if it'll let me, because the accounts are supposed to be connected. It's so working on Zoom, I'm being told. Yeah, it's working on Zoom. Um, we can tell the people on Facebook to go to the Zoom site if you that. want to do that. Okay. Otherwise. So, um, okay, I'll just let the people know on Facebook. All right. All right, so Duke and Sons Tobacco Factory um, is uh, right there on the railroad tracks. Just to get you oriented, just to the right of this building, you can barely see the little brick wall on the far right is the, today's Durham train station. Durham train station. The road between the Duke factory and the, and the train station was called Cigarette Street. Cigarette Street. So, quick history about tobacco and, Doom, and, and Duke. Uh, 1865, there was one tobacco factory in Durham, 1865. 1869, there were four tobacco factories. 1872, there were 12. All of this happened before, the, before Duke Tobacco showed up in Durham in 1878. So they were not the first here in town. In fact, they were quite late in the game. They had their uh, small operation out at Duke Homestead. But, uh, you know, 1872, there were uh, 12 tobacco factories and uh, Duke, uh, Duke Tobacco didn't show up until 1878. So this is uh, um, Duke and Sons on the railroad tracks. To the left is uh, the Chesterfield building, which is not yet built. A uh, number of uh, theories as to why uh, so many of these uh, tobacco factories went from, two, from four stories to two stories. One is uh, heavy equipment. One is fire insurance. It seems to be some sort of a systemic reason because it did happen around town, not just with one or two buildings. But this is uh, uh, Duke and, and Sons. In the, uh, in the train station to the right, you have some very cool, they did some very cool large black and white photographs of uh, some, some uh, famous Durhamites, including a, a nice history of Blind Boy Fuller. So Blind Boy Fuller was uh, the father of Piedmont Blues. Um, he uh, would busk for money in the warehouses and, and in the uh, streets around Durham. He would also play at house parties at Haytai. Uh, he was buried um, near uh, Fayetteville Street Elementary School. And actually the city has a marker up for him there near Fayetteville Street Elementary, and they also have a a nice historic estate marker in front of Stanford Warren Library. Um, And lastly, the Dukes hired uh, several cigar rollers to come down from New York City. And uh, these were early members of the Jewish community in Durham, and many of them moved to Cleveland Holloway uh, behind uh, the, the, the newly renovated library. Um, and it was, it was these cigar rollers that were some of the first to introduce um, tr- uh, labor unions in Durham. So this is where you had your early history of labor unions in Durham was bringing in cigar, cigar rollers from New York City, which 
you know, eventually, you know, that builds up to the, the general strike of 1934 with mill workers. All right, so if we could have the next slide. This is a very rare postcard. It's called Making Bull Durham. And um, uh, it, it, there's often, you know, the first thing people see in this, this is, first thing people see in this postcard is the, is the kids. You know, the kid, these are kids working in this, in this uh, Duke factory. Um, and there's tension. When I talk to mill workers, there's a tension between um, historians that mill workers say focus too much on child labor and don't talk about um, the mill workers and their families and their sense of community, you know, like a family. Um, and then there's historians who tell me, well, mill workers are sometimes guilty of too much nostalgia. So there is a tension between historians and mill workers, or in this case, tobacco workers, about how their history is treated. And um, it's, it's interesting to sit, you know, and talk uh, to folks about uh, how they feel about how their histories are being, are being treated. Um, but I have to point out the Bonsac cigarette, cigarette making machine. This is, this is a game changer. Bonsac uh, rolled cigarettes with a machine, not hand rolls. So, uh, you know, instead of making a few cigarettes uh, a minute, you can make, you know, hundreds, of, you know, thousands an hour. And so what did Buck do? Buck Duke do? He went and bought Bonsac cigarette making machines, number one. He then... Um, he then uh, hired the mechanics working on him because it was off. They often got stuck and jammed like a paper photocopy paper machine now. And number three, and that's exactly his competition. So um, making of Bull Durham and Um, they said, let's call it bull. So well, I just lost the screen and the, and the postcards, April. Are we on? Did we lose? John, in the meantime, while April is getting that, um, Ken McDonald has a question. Yeah. Uh, where in Maplewood Cemetery is Christian of the Mill buried? Mill on the east. Uh, he is buried right near Kent Street, very close to John Sprunt Hill. I'm going to talk about John Sprunt Hill later. So if you see, he's not in the Duke section. He's not in the Duke section. He's in the he's in the near section C. So on the east side of Kent Street, the downtown side of Kent Street, which is just south of Grubb and Durham Co-op, Christian is right there, and he has a house. Tom Miller explained this to me. A, a house. Uh, headstone, which I think is supposed to reflect the shape of a Victorian house. You have different symbols of death, like a cut column, you know, with a drape over it. And it's a wonderful tour to go on with Preservation Durham and other groups that host these tours of Maplewood. But uh, Christian is on Kent Street, uh, just near John Sprunt Hill, who has the tallest obelisk in that part of the cemetery. Okay, so we're back. Thank you, uh, April. We're back on uh, Making Bull Durham. And I just wanted to finish up my point. I can't see me. What, what, something just happened. Let me just see me. I can see me. So they look down at the table and they and Green and Morris, and by the way, Green Street, Morris Street, uh, said, let's make uh, a, a product called uh, Bull Durham. So that's where the name came from. And here is something that uh, John McDonald gave me. John McDonald is uh, the owner of McDonald's Drugstore on 9th Street, and he gave this to me before he died. And this is a small cotton bag of uh, tobacco leaf, and it's guaranteed genuine because it has a bull on it. That means it's guaranteed genuine. And this packet came with a free book of cigarette papers. So this is before the cigarette machine. And this cotton bag, by the way, is why they needed to have cotton mills, because the cottage industry of you know women on porches sewing cotton bags wasn't working with their machinery, and so they wanted to uh, have build cotton mills to make uniform uh, cotton bags for their products. But this is a, an old, old 
Uh, this is, bef you know, this is Blackwell. So this is an old, old bag of tobacco, which should probably go in a museum somewhere. Okay, so I don't know. I don't, I don't know if you have any ideas about that, Patrick. But all right, so um, let's go on to the next slide. And uh, this is uh, Chesterfield Cigarette Factory, still standing today. They just put that sign back. This is an old postcard, older postcard, but that sign has now returned to its place. And uh, this building, most modern, was also going to be the most, you know, the largest in the world. If you walk, so downtown is to the left. If you walk downtown from here, so we're looking at it from uh, Toreros. If you walk downtown from here and look back, you'll see that that whole wall facing downtown by the, by the West End Wine Bar uh, is cinder block. That was a temporary wall. This building was going to be doubled in size. It was going to go all the way through West End Wine Bar, all the way to the Loop. That's how big this was going to be. This is, this is the famous chrome sign outside that says dedicated to the millions of satisfied smokers of Chesterfield. So uh, that never happened. January 11th, 1964, the Surgeon General put out a report saying uh, cigarettes uh, are not healthy. And they can kill you. So uh, that building was never doubled in size. And therefore, we still have all those smaller buildings, um, uh, all those smaller buildings um, on, the, on the downtown side. This was built on top of Washington Duke's house. The Washington Duke's house was right here. And uh, it's funny that you, some of these things, you know, they, they, they say on the back, you know, come on a free tour and we'll give you cigarettes at the end. So they, they hand out packets of cigarettes at the end of these uh, factory tours. I heard right, they, April? yeah, John. I heard that they gave um, cigarettes to children. Yeah. Is that true? Yeah, and then even I went to Duke Home when I first moved here in 1993. I went to Duke Homestead, and all the chairs in the uh, little theater there had cigarette ashtrays in the backs of the chairs, and they had cigarettes in them, cigarette butts in them. And when <laughs> when my mother and I, our car broke down in Richmond, and we went on a tour of Philip Morris on in a golf cart, by the way. Uh, looking at their cigarette factory, um, all the safety signs for the employees were all on easels, and they were all pointed at the at the golf carts, not at the not at the employees. Okay, let's move on to the next tour. The next, uh, I just want to do a quick reminder, folks. Don't uh, remember to continue asking questions. You're doing a great job. Right now, we have 79 people participating so far. Um, it looks like we're not as strongly connected on Facebook. Uh, but if you can, you can join the Zoom live. Um, if you're trying to get on Facebook, um, the ID is 931-573-757. Um, but keep the questions coming. All right. Thank you, John. And the good news is we haven't been Zoom bombed yet. Okay. So this is, this next postcard is American Tobacco. And uh, it's an unusual view because it's American Tobacco kind of from the East West Expressway corner. Took me a while to figure out the angle, but this is a uh, American Tobacco uh, factory, um, uh, right on the what's now called the Durham Freeway. April, are we moving the slide? So um, there we go. It's an unusual angle. You can see the downtown church steeples over there on the left, uh, but the Durham Ex Express it would be just over here, down you know down to the bottom. Um, and, you know, let's talk about the East-West Expressway. You, you know, it, it, there's a new sign. There are new signs that have just been put up in the Expressway in the past two years. They're bright yellow diamonds with black arrows that curve like this. They've only been up for, I take the Durham Freeway every day to work. I used to. The, there are these curve, you know, curve ahead. So everyone knows in downtown Durham, everyone slows down because the traffic is curling around downtown Durham, um, unlike most, um, um, you know, major highways. And that's because of uh, the way planners decided to go around white-owned factories and into black neighborhoods. So if it comes in from, coming in from Hillsboro, what does it do? It curves around Irwin Mills into Brookstown and Hickstown, uh, West End, Crest Street. And then it, what does it do then? You see these signs? It curves over to the left, and then occurs again around American Tobacco, goes right around here, uh, where you, the traffic slows down on this sharp turn, not too far from Vickers. And it goes around the white-owned business, and it goes out into Haytai. And then it curves back in 
and then it straightens up after it gets past all the white owned businesses. So that's an early example of environmental injustice, environmental racism. Um, you know, you have your hilltops and creek bottoms going to white neighborhoods and black neighborhoods. And then you have this downtown highway uh, that was that's curving through and around and avoiding the white owned businesses. And let me just say, you know, that uh, promises made, promises broken. Yes, there was a segment of the African-American community that supported the expressway, um, but a lot that opposed. And number two, promises were made that were never given. So uh, that, that, that's, um, that's uh, those are broken promises that, uh, you know, to replace the, the 500 uh, businesses that they were taken out uh, along Pettigrew in, 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 in Haiti and the families that were displaced. Um, and then just last night on, on uh, Prime, I was watching the four, first four episodes of Jack Benny. And Jack Benny is sponsored by American Tobacco. And he had skits in his show going to American Tobacco headquarters, asking for them to renew his contract. Um, and then they have commercials for Lucky Strikes throughout the Jack Benny show. Was, in fact, they called it the Lucky Strike show with Jack Benny. Um, and the skits are, it's an amazing, I mean, if you think about it, it's, it's an amazing time, but it was Jack Benny's first four, uh, you know, back when he, was, he went from radio to TV, and it was all about the only advertiser and the only, you know, um, commercial we saw was, uh, was a lucky strike. Okay, if there's no questions, we can go on to the next one. Oh, we're almost actually, we, have, we have to get going, actually. Catch actually, up. John, there is a question. Yeah. Um, uh, Gary La Placa, La Plaza um, said, John, the, the Museum of History in Raleigh has pockets of Bull Durham tobacco um, in their display. Um, um, packets, I'm sorry, packets of Bull Durham tobacco in their display. I bet they would accept yours too. <laughs> yours to add to their collection, especially with the authentic bull medallion. medallion. Some of my best friends live in Raleigh. This is going to stay in Durham. All right, next postcard ah! is the Carolina <laughs> Hotel. And this is uh, uh, owned by uh, Julian Shakespeare Carr. We talked about him a lot last week, but again, KKK supported, gave money to white supremacist groups, helped support the groups behind the, the white mob in Wilmington. Um, uh, he had held Confederate reunions here at this hotel. This stood at the corner of Corcoran and the railroad tracks. So this is overlooking the railroad tracks. If you stood in those balconies and looked to your left, you would see what is today the Durham Performing Arts Center. Um, today, it is a parking lot. Um, before the hotel, and there was a smaller hotel, and before that, this was Bartlett Durham's house. So Bartlett Durham lived on this corner. So the namesake, you know, the story goes, the train company tried to buy land from Prattsburg, they said, uh, Prattsburg said no, so they bought it from Durham instead, and, and we're called Durham and not Prattsburg because of that decision. Um, he was uh, buried down in Chatham County. So back to John McDonald, who uh, I would sit in the back of McDonald's drugstore and talk with for afternoons. Um, he told me that he went, when they moved Bartlett Durham's body from Chatham County to Maplewood Cemetery, a large crowd showed up and he was a little kid, so they allowed him to, they kind of pushed him to the front and he went up and looked at the casket of Bartlett Durham and, and there was a glass window right above his face. And John McDonald looked into the window and saw Bartlett Durham's perfectly pre preserved face, what he called them spectacles, still on his nose. Okay, next slide is Old Bull. We're gonna catch up because we're, we're not, I'm, I gotta catch up to halfway, April. This is Old Bull. Um, this is uh, uh, the oldest brick building in Durham, and uh, so just to the left of this is Deepak, as you as you guys know. It's this corner. So this is Kitty Corner from Bartlett Durham's house. This corner, in my opinion, is the most important corner in Durham history. Why? Because the early tobacco warehouses and factories before Old Bull, Green, and Morris were located on this corner and across the street. The, one of the factories was on this corner, and then Green and Morris had warehouses across the street where the Corcoran Street parking deck is today. The third corner we've already talked about, that was Bartlett Durham's house, and also later Carolina Hotel, and then a cotton mill. And then that's now a parking lot. And then the, th the fourth corner was Durham Station, the, the, the train station, that, uh, the, the depot where this all started. So this corner has a very important um, significance to, to, uh, to Durham history. 
All right, so moving on to our halfway point, this is uh, five points. That's the Piedmont uh, Flatiron building. That's now gone. So what you're looking at right now today would be the parking lot of 9th Street Bakery. Uh, so to the right is Viceroy and to the left is uh, the Durham Arts Council off screen. So uh, the Piedmont Flatiron building um, before that was the first public library in North Carolina. That's where it was. In fact, uh, the, the kind people at the North Carolina collection asked for my postcard of that library, which I just recently got, and they're going to include it in uh, display when the library opens. But the first public library was a, looks like a big, it basically looks like a, a house, uh, was on this corner. And uh, uh, time came when they wanted to build a bigger library. Julian Shakespeare Carr was head of the library trustees, um, and they wanted to, uh, you know, Car Carnegie, Carnegie offered to, you know, like he did in many towns, he offered to pay for the library. So Carnegie built libraries all over uh, the country, including Durham. And Julian Shakespeare Carr was adamant. He was very opposed to accepting money from Carnegie because Carnegie was a Yankee. And he wanted his trustees to reject the offer from Carnegie to, um, to pay for the library. And he lost that vote. And if you go down to the library down on East Main Street, just near the churches down there on East Main, uh, First Presbyterian and, and Phillips, St. Phillips, you'll see the Carnegie Library with two lions out front. That, that was it. That was the library for many, many years. And they still have the lions out front. Um, and so Carr lost that fight. All right, so next. This is downtown Durham. This is, I love this postcard. I can look at this postcard all day. Street, it's Chapel Hill Street, and um, Moore Street was Moore Street. April, I lost the postcard. So, uh, but uh, I do want to point out in an old old map of um, of Durham of of Durham is uh, right where Mother and Sons is today, and right where uh, Verton Vogue is today. So, up there by Five Points is uh, was a clover field. So you have a clover field at Green and Morris, which I think is, which I think is charming. Okay, let's go on to uh, the next postcard. This is beautiful train station, beautiful handwriting with, and that's cool because you can see all the train companies that came through, through Durham, uh, Seaboard, Southern, Norfolk, you know, and, and, and on Oxford and Clarks. So um, it was chaos because each train company had their own tracks and in some cases their own stations. And so this is called Union Station, not because of the Union Army, but because it was an effort to bring all the train companies under one roof, to bring them all to, it's the union of all the train companies. That's why it's called um, Union Station. And this train station is on what's now the loop. So if you were to stand in that tower and look straight out, you'd be looking straight at the Durham Performing Arts, the Durham Performing Arts Center. All right, moving on. This is the corner of Corcoran and Maine. Corcoran and Maine. So to the right, that building is still standing. Uh, an old bank to the left uh, is Corcoran. And then um, uh, uh, just in the front, the very, very front bottom left is the, is the uh, trust building, which is still standing. So the building uh, with the awnings and the smack dab in the middle of this postcard is, was uh, the gear building. That was called the gear building. Um, and it was built to look like a, a palace in Florence, Italy. It was built to look like a palace in Florence, Italy. Those awnings down there on the right uh, is, um, uh, that went on to become Woolworths. 
Uh, so Woolworths was the site of many sit-ins uh, in Durham after Greensboro. Of course, those were three years after Royal Ice Cream, which happened in 1957, in which we got a state highway marker for that courageous effort, uh, sit-in at, at an ice cream store um, near, near uh, Cleveland Holloway Union Baptist Church. So today, that Florentine building in the middle is now one city center. It's one city center. And um, I think this is a, a time to talk about gentrification a little bit. So I, I, I see in, in, in neighborhoods in downtown around Durham, two kinds of gentrification, institutional gentrification and kind of a natural gentrification. Natural is like Irwin Mills employees who, who are dying off like a World War II generation and the houses kind of sit in their juices for 25 years. Uh, and then young people come in and, and renovate the houses. Institutional gentrification, there's a chronic, uh, an article in the Chronicle of Higher Education where universities are some of the biggest drivers of gentrification. So inter institutional gentrification is where a university like Duke might give millions of dollars in low interest loans to renovate Walltown, driving up real estate prices, people can't afford to live there. And um, Duke in a press release said it was because of enlightened self-interest uh, to fix Walltown. So that's, there, I'm, so I'm distinguishing two kinds of gentrification there. Another example is the money uh, that low interest loans that Duke did for Southside St. Teresa that resulted in um, 42 of those 44 houses to go from black to white. All right, and up on your left there of this postcard, you see Black Wall Street, um, which we're gonna talk about in my next postcard, but that's a uh, parish street uh, known as Black Wall Street. So keep that in mind, I mean, look at that street. Some, some of the largest African-American owned businesses in the country are there. Um, and this is all happening, you know, between the years of the white mob violence in Wilmington in 1898 and the white mob violence in Tulsa in, um, in 1921. So go on to the next postcard. You know, re race relations in Durham were not always good, but, but these are some pretty significant advances in, in, uh, in, in economic uh, advancement for the Afro-American community and, and, and they're here in Durham. In fact, Booker T. Washington would go around the country and say, you haven't seen anything until you've seen what they're doing in Durham, North Carolina. So this is North Carolina Mutual. Uh, it is the largest, it was the largest African-American owned financial institution in the country. And then also on this street, you had Mechanics and Farmers Bank. So you could give loans to African-American families because they were having trouble getting loans um, through white banks. So this is a pretty, uh, um, cool postcard. I, uh, I just got it recently. I actually sent it to April last week to add it to the collection. I thank you, April, for adding it. But um, that, that is um, Black Wall Street. And there's, of course, a sign down there honoring Black Wall Street. All right, next. All right, this is the old post office. And uh, that's the trust building on the left. So that's still standing. And then in the back is, is going to be my next postcard. So the trust building is there, and that was built in 1905. And when it was built, it was the tallest office building in the state. So take that to your next cocktail party. Durham had the tallest office building in the state uh, in 1905. Um, now it's, uh, the post office is now 21C. So we're looking straight at 21C. And you can also, by the way, see trolley tracks in the foreground. I love these old postcards because it has all these, like, some of them have, like, puddles painted onto the postcards and ruts and footprints. I just love these old postcards. This postcard doesn't show it, but if you go onto my collection at Postcards from Durham on Instagram, you can see it. The old lights in front of the post office are the same ones you see in front of the post office on Chapel Hill Street today. They have these old green lights with those white globes. Those are now in front of the new post office. So this is a courthouse and a uh, post office and then behind it go on to the next slide please was a combination of many things today you would be looking at the durham performing arts center the farmers market and city hall all in one building so the bottom floor was city hall right next to the farmers market and the top floor was the performance hall for mu for music in fact just to the left that red brick building with the arched windows that's market street 
And Market Street is called Market Street because of the farmer's market that was here in this building. So all three in one, and that's, that's a pretty cool thing. So later on, City Hall moved into the old city high school, the farmer's market moved into the armory, and the performance hall was set up uh, down the road. Uh, and this was torn down and replaced with the Washington Duke building, the Washington Duke Hotel. And today, if you're standing right here, you're looking at probably the most famous Instagram star of Durham, and that is Major the Bull. Right there, smack dab in the middle of that postcard is Major the Bull. All right. This is Corcoran, looking down towards uh, the Durham Bulls Athletic Park and the Durham Performing Arts Center. So on the right is the post office. Uh, that's now 21C. On the left is the Florentine Palace that is now one city center. And straight ahead is, is, is uh, the bank that's still standing. It's First National. So down by uh, the area down by the Durham Performing Arts Center was a flour mill. There was um, uh, 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 Durham College was there for a while. So Durham College, let me talk about Durham College. Durham College was started by um, by uh, Lucinda McCauley Harris with five typewriters. Her husband was a custodian at a typewriter company. They borrowed five old typewriters and started Durham College uh, just down the road from here. And in the end, 5,000 people went through that college to, and are now working in federal agencies, the World Bank and all over. It all started with five typewriters. The college moved around a little bit. And in the end, it, 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 its final campus is still standing. Many of the buildings are still standing on Fayetteville Street near the Chicken Hut and the Food Line. Uh, the men's dorm, the women's dorm is still standing, the administrative building is still standing, the gymnasium is still standing, it's Faith Assembly. And in fact, the gymnasium was named the Muhammad Ali Gymnasium. And Muhammad Ali came to Durham in uh, 1977 and dedicated a museum, the Muhammad Ali Museum. And according to Durham College alums, he, he was the first building in the United States named after Muhammad Ali. And uh, it's still standing. Um, right there on Fable Street across from the Chicken Hut. All right, so um, let's move on to the next slide. This is the Hill Building. I had promised to talk about um, about John Sprunt Hill. He was a, uh, he built a banking empire in Durham. Uh, he donated the land that is now Duke Park, Park, uh, Northgate Park, uh, Hillendale, which is by the way, Durham's first golf course. So John Sprunt Hill um, uh, donated a lot of land to, to the city. Um, I can say this, when you go up on top, I've been up there, it's very, very windy up there. So any, any you wanna slow down and have any questions or you wanna keep going, April, Patrick? There is um, one question, someone asked, what is the oldest, build, oldest building in Durham now? Um, Neil, uh, it was, Old Bull is is by far the oldest brick building. I don't know if I don't know if there's a, a house maybe on East Trinity that's older, but Old Bull, 1874, is the oldest brick building in Durham. Okay, and Neil asked, uh, what is the oldest house in in Durham? I know the oldest house just got torn down. I don't know what the next oldest house is, um, but we can try to figure that out for you. Yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, Buck Dukes or Washington Duke's brother, his house was torn down recently. That was an old house out, out near uh, old Oxford. Um, and then there's a house on East Trinity. Uh, to Niles, I would suggest uh, going to what is an amazing local resource, and that is Open Durham, which is run by Preservation Durham. It's an amazing resource, OpenDurham.org. All right, so the next slide, I'm just putting this out here for fun, but this is uh, something you all might Recognize, and this is April. This is um, oh, sorry. Uh, Shreve, Lamb, and Harmon are the architects of this building and the 21C in Durham. So this is actually the older, taller sister than uh, the 21C, but Shreve, Lamb, and Harmon were the architects. And in fact, for a while, they had offices on the top floor of the Hill building. So um, I'm just putting that out there because you know, a little connection between us and uh, the Big Apple. All right, the next uh, postcard is uh, the Hill Building, but also the Washington Duke Hotel. And so the Washington Duke uh, became 
uh, later it was it was called the Jack Tar Hotel, and later it was called the Jack. You know, so there's the Jack Tar Hotel and the Jack, and then the Washington Duke. Not to be confused with the Jack Tar Motel across the street. But the Washington Duke Hotel was was uh, you know the, the night one of the nicest hotels in the South. And I just want to show this to everybody. This is an ashtray from the Washington Duke Hotel. I'm going to hold this up real close, and you can see Washington Duke there. But that's an old ashtray from the Washington Duke Hotel uh, back in its glory days. In the end, they tried to give it away because it was too expensive to keep going. They even tried to give it to the Boy Scouts for free for their annual conferences and other meetings. But um, they, ended up, they ended up having to tear it down, which led to uh, such outrage that uh, it led to the creation of a movement for, pres for preserving historic building. So I think that the two biggest losses are the Washington Duke Hotel and the old Durham train station. And by the way, uh, you know, that's Corcoran Street you're looking at there in the front, and there, 21C is still there, of course. So Corcoran Street then curves, uh, about 20 years ago, they curved Port Corcoran Street over to meet up with Foster Street. So that, where you see the word hotel down there in the, that front portico, that's all now Foster Street that's been curved over to, excuse me, Corcoran, that's been moved over to Cork to Foster. And then you have Major the Bull, you know, just to the right of that, Major the Bull. Okie dokie. So I'm gonna, uh, you know, this is a, a bridge between the old and the new. Again, on the left was the Washington Duke Hotel and the Jack Tar. On the right was the Jack Tar Motel, All right? And so that's, an old causeway that went across uh, to stop having uh, black people and white people sitting at his lunch counter together. And he told the judge, I, I don't want to do that. And the judge said, you have to, and if you don't, I'm going to send the sheriff. And so Mud Evans read the local ordinance and found that if you don't have seats, you can do it. So he took away his seats. And now you have a lunch counter with standing African-Americans and whites together having sandwiches and lunch together, and the sheriff couldn't do anything about it. Mud Evans was also the first person uh, on Main Street to have restrooms uh, for African-Americans. So he went on to become mayor. He was a beloved mayor of Durham. He uh, uh, was here for six terms. He um, oversaw desegregation of schools in Durham, public agencies, uh, police department, and fire department. That was all Mud Evans. We all have our flaws. He, um, you know, he went to UNC, but he married a Dukey, but that's okay. We can get past that. All right, so this, I'm ending with this postcard, and, um, and uh, I, just, I just lost, there it goes. Um, I just want to kind of, again, make a bridge to the past. That on the left at the Jack Tar is where Martin, Martin Luther King spoke six times in, in Durham. In fact, he was supposed to speak in Durham on the day he was assassinated. But on the left, there's some famous pictures of, of Martin Luther King speaking at the Jack Tar. And on the right, there's lots of pictures online of President Obama at the Blue Coffee, at Blue Coffee um, what is now Neomond, in the right. So there's kind of a bridge uh, to the past. I will stop there and remind you, I, have, I do have postcards from Durham on Instagram, which is a lot, lot more than what I'm showing today. And I will entertain any questions in the six minutes we have left. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, April. Thank you, John, John. Thank you. So, uh, uh, did we already did we answer Neil's question already? Yes, um, the That's oldest, great. the tallest building, old and the oldest house. And yes, we, yeah, did, we talked yeah. about that. Okay, great. Uh, let's see. Are there any other questions? People are saying thank you so much. They learned a lot. Um, 
Um, Jane said, thank you so much. Kathy Justice says, thank you. It was a great presentation. Um, Debbie Palladino says she loved this. Carolyn said, thanks. She enjoyed it. So it looks like we don't have any other questions. Um, so April, next week, we're gonna continue our journey uh, and keep going east. We're gonna cover North Carolina Central University, some of the cotton mills in East Durham, which by the way, was many parts of East Durham was historically white, blue collar. And we're gonna even get into tobacco fields and the beginnings of Research Triangle Park and how that changed the course of history of not just Durham, but, but uh, North Carolina. Okay, cool. Thank you so much, John. Thank you all for attending. Um, oh, there's a last minute question. Where did you find your postcards? They're incredible. Great storytelling. From uh, Kennedy Antiques. Uh, uh, I went to a couple weird postcard conventions, which are kind of weird. Uh, little hotels on the interstate outside of Burlington. You are a true history nerd. <laughs> and, and, uh, and now I'm just, you know, I'm, I've become a millennial. It's just eBay. <laughs> My and, poor uh, kids. My John, kids are John we have a few more questions coming in too. Uh, uh, John, it's just postcards at postcards from Durham. Instagram is at postcard is postcards from Durham. One word. Great. Um, and there are a couple of other questions. Uh, Peter Hymas wants to know: Are there any descendants of Bartlett Durham that are still that still live here? I don't know the answer to that question. It, when I went to the talk about Julian Shakespeare Carr at, in the Carr building at Duke a couple weeks ago, uh, lo and behold, his, uh, a descendant of his was there. And he was very uh, cool about it and, and understood the, the stuff his grandfather did. But um, it was, I thought, cool that he showed up. I don't know about Bartlett Durham. Great. And I don't know if his glass in his coffin still shows a perfectly preserved face with spectacles on the nose. And John, did you uh, cover uh, have anything more to say about Maplewood Cemetery? Uh, the Dukes, you know, Washington Duke was buried there, uh, and then they moved them to the, later to Crypt Chapel. So there's so, still some Dukes buried there, but a lot of the most important uh, members have been moved to the Crypt of Duke Chapel, along with Terry Sanford and his wife, and and, a, and some other presidents of Duke, and and um, uh, so there's uh, that area with a beautiful mausoleum with some stained glass windows. There's a car family plot. There's, you know, all the street names. Are, I call them the street names. All the street names are there. Moorhead, you know, they're all there. Yancey, you just walk up and down through the headstones and there's all these street names. The Fitzgeralds are there. You know, Fitzgeralds, um, I'll talk about Polly Murray. I'll talk about Polly Murray next week, but the Fitzgeralds, they had their own family cemetery. And for years, the city of Durham would not include the Fitzgerald Cemetery with the Maplewood Cemetery. And finally, when I first moved here, like in the early 90s, they moved the fence around and brought the whole cemetery together. But the Fitzgerald family, I talked about this in the first week, they had a 17-room 17 17 house called the Maples, uh, not too far from Campus Drive in the West End. And uh, um, they have uh, uh, folks from the family, you know, Richard and Robert Fitzgerald, who made most of the bricks in town, and Polly Murray, who is a hero and Durham's first saint. You know, she sat in the front of the bus 20 years before Rosa Parks. She sat at a lunch counter in Washington, D.C. 20 years before Greensboro. She helped found the National Organization of Women. She helped write legal documents for Thurgood Marshall for Brown versus the Board of Education. She was a poet. She was a writer. She's, and she's ours. She was, you know, grew up on Carroll Street and wrote about it in Proud Shoes, a highly uh, recommended book. All right, thank you. Um, I think, let's see, the other question was, uh, you said you were gonna say something, um, Jim Borg said that you were gonna say something about Maplewood Cemetery at the end. Was That's next week, right? Well, I talked about, uh, I was gonna talk about the Hebrew Cemetery at Maplewood Cemetery because the question came up. But um, I, I, I went on to describe it, but there's, uh, that's where Mud Evans is buried. Uh, it, it's, I learned about the stones that you, know, you didn't have flowers in, in dry, arid countries, and so you have stones. I learned about, uh, when I took the tour, that you're buried by the time of death. So you, you could be buried here, and your wife could be buried like seven, seven plots up, because she died you know, after you. So, um, 
And there's also a very poignant memorial there of, at, with ash, ashes from Dachau that were um, honored there about five years ago. And there's a little memorial there for that. It's a very cool place uh, next to Maplewood. Um, there are a few more questions. Someone, Leah Rutchik, she asked about the Hebrew cemetery, but I think you just answered that. Um, uh, Leah, if that doesn't answer your question, just send us another one. Um, um, and then Niels asked again, he said, how was the Jewish community generally treated in Durham throughout history, if you happen to know that? Uh, well, Mud Evans was elected mayor with support from both whites and blacks. Uh, he, I, I recommend, in addition to Proud Shoes, I recommend the book, The Provincials. Uh, it's an outstanding book by the son of Mud Evans, Eli who writes not just about Jewish life in Durham, but Jewish life in the South. It's called The Provincials, and it's a very good book that describes uh, the ups and downs of being Jewish in the South. Okay, great. And then we have one more question. Is the hotel where Carr, uh, uh, Niels asked, if, is the hotel where Carr held Confederate veterans meetings still standing today? No, it was torn down and replaced by a five-story cotton mill. And that has since been torn down and is replaced by a small parking lot. Okay. All right. I think these other questions were already answered. Okay. All right. One o'clock. Peace out. One o'clock. Bye. Thank you so much. See you all. See you all next week. Bye.